Hello, everybody. It's good to see you all on Facebook land, and uh, we're glad that you're able to join us at Spirit of Grace Church and be a part of what God is doing. Uh, we're thankful for his many blessings and and the, the move of God. Uh, we've had several baptisms recently. We've got more coming up in a couple of weeks. It's a wonderful time to be a part of the church, even in the midst of everything that's going on in the medical season we're in and the political season that we're in. Uh, I'm just glad that I have a church and a church family to uh, be supportive of and to be supported by, and we appreciate you all so very much. I want to uh, invite you to open up to John chapter 10 tonight. John chapter 10, I got to thinking about this topic a little bit this afternoon and uh, wanted to share it with you this evening. And uh, I can see some are joining on Facebook already as well as on our Zoom. Uh, so we're, go we're going to go, I'm just going to read starting at verse number one tonight and go through to verse number 11. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know, uh, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things uh, they were which he spake unto them. And so Jesus said unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not uh, hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And I want to focus in on the second part of uh, verse 10. And you've probably heard a lot of different lessons through the years on this passage. But uh, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful for the life that God has provided. And, and I pray that something that would be said here tonight would help you to have a more abundant life. And uh, in order to start with that, I, I need to just give you some definition uh, in the, the Greek in which this book of John was written. Uh, he uses the word life there, and, then, and just a research of what that word means or stands for is an active and vigorous, devoted to God and blessed life. Uh, in other words, when Jesus says, I want to give them more abundantly, uh, a life that's more abundantly. It's not just more of the stuff that happens here on earth that, that we classify as our life. It's, it's that which is active and vigorous in devotion to God and being blessed because of the devotion to God. And, uh, and, and so I'm, ex I'm excited to have the opportunity to have real life. Life is not just breathing in and out and having your heart pump your blood through your body. It is being devoted to, to God. If death is separation from God, then life is unity with God. And so uh, Jesus is saying to us in this passage, I came for one reason, and that's to unite people, if you will, men and women, children, to me and, and bring them to me. And in, in order to do that, uh, in verse 11, I gave up my life so that uh, you could have your life. And then he uses the word more abundantly. That, that word more abundantly is, is uh, an interesting word. It means to be superior or remarkable or something that's further than normal. And then I, I saw this meaning and it was, it was kind of interesting to, to read it. And it was simply this, more plainly. In other words, there's more clarity. There's more, uh, when, when we have his life and he wants to give it to us more abundantly, it's not that he wants to give us necessarily more of quantity, 
but he's wanting to make it clearer and more real and more effective and superior to what our life was. When he died on the cross, he was exchanging uh, his life for ours so that you and I can exchange our old man for our new man and have a brand new life that is far superior than our old life and far superior to that which we can do on our own because of what he's done for us. And uh, it's exciting to know that Jesus loves us so much that he wants us to uh, have a life that is ordained and anointed by him and fulfilled by him, the great creator of all things. It allows us to have a life that is superior or remarkable that we would not have without him. And uh, so I got to thinking about that and I've read some things recently and there's, you know, if you're on Facebook any length of time, you'll see all kinds of things or Instagram or whatever, just postings of you know, the 10 things of this and the 12 things of that or whatever. And uh, I remember reading several weeks or months ago uh, a couple different things. And, and so I'm kind of wanting to bring them to you tonight because there's five things that I want to just share with you that I believe uh, helps us be, fulf be more fulfilled in the life that he has for us, in the life that he's designed for us. Um, he came to bring us life or give us life and that more abundantly, but he's not wanting just to do it for us. He's wanting to do it with us. Uh, at Spirit of Grace Church, we, we mentioned this, we do life together. And uh, there's several churches that use that same motto, but we do life together. Jesus wants us to do life with him, not just let him do our life. And, and there's things that we can do to give us more a sense of, that abundant life that he is wanting to have uh, us involved in. So I want to just share these five things with you tonight, because if we can grasp these five things, our lives would totally be turned inside out and upside down, and we would have so much more joy uh, than what we even have today. So number one, don't compare your life to others and don't judge them. You have no idea what their journey is all about. I've often said that this is probably one of the, the two things that I think most children of God suffer with is, number one, a lack of confidence in their relationship with God. They're always wondering if they're doing the right thing, saying the right thing, pleasing God. And then the second thing is we compare ourselves to others. You were not designed like I was designed by God, and I was not designed like you were designed by God. And so we, we, there's no comparison. When you compare yourself to somebody else, you're thinking you're comparing yourself apple to apple, but you're really comparing yourself uh, an apple to an orange or a pear or a banana, whatever it is. Uh, it's not the same thing. You're, uh, and, and so you may think that your life is less than somebody else's or their life is less than yours, or vice versa. And in all actuality, you don't know what their journey is. They don't know what your journey is. They don't know what you've dealt with. You don't know what they've dealt with. So stop comparing yourself to one another and just compare yourself to the Word of God. When you compare yourself just to the Word of God, you'll realize that you don't measure up to the things of the Word of God without having His hand holding your hand. And the others around you, they don't measure up if they don't have their hand in the hand of the master as well. And so if you, if we, part of the comparing is the judging of others. Well, how can God use this person? I know what they, well, we don't know what their journey and their relationship with the Lord is, and we don't understand everything that they're doing. And so stop comparing or judging with one another and your life becomes a whole lot. If I'm less worried about what my neighbor is doing and comparing myself to my neighbor and comparing myself to, if I'm, constantly trying consuming my uh, mind and my spirit and trying to become like uh, you know John Doe down the street um, it frees me up that time is freed up to do other things for God that I'm not doing right now and so if we could ever even get just this one down stop comparing ourselves and judging uh, it's amazing what God would do through us and in us and give us the opportunity to become really what God wants us to become. Jesus didn't compare himself to anybody else and uh, because he was incomparable. Um, and really, we're incomparable, not in the same way that Christ was, but we're incomparable in the fact that 
Uh, we have our own fingerprint. We have our own uh, God imprint on us. Each one of us has a different imprint of God upon us because God is an individual God. He's an individual relationship God. He, he honors us and deals with us on a corporate level. But when, when it comes right down to it, or the old phrase, when the rubber meets the road, it's a relationship between me and God. And it's a relationship between you and God. And my relationship's not going to be the same as yours. And yours isn't going to be the same of, as mine. So uh, that's the first thing that will release you into more of a life that is abundant is if we don't compare ourselves and don't judge ourselves. Uh, number four, and this one is a little bit more difficult to uh, encapsulate necessarily, but no one is in charge of your happiness except you. No one is in charge of your happiness except you because happiness is a point of reference. It's a perspective. Uh, happiness is how you decide uh, what your situation is. Happiness is an emotion that we can control. Um, let me put it to you this way. Paul said it this way, and, and he didn't use the exact word happiness. He used contentment, but he said, I've learned how to be content whatsoever state I'm at because I know who Jesus is. And nobody is responsible or is in charge of your happiness except for you. You can respond to whatever situation you're in. I can respond to whatever situation I'm in, and I can do it with joy and peace and happiness, or I can let the circumstances around me or the other things that are around us uh, criticize and push us down and beat us up, but they're not responsible for my happiness, and they're not the cause or the, they're not in charge of it, and they're not the cause of my unhappiness. My unhappiness is because I haven't spent enough time with him to realize how blessed I actually am and looked in the situation and still be able to smile and say, God loves me, even though I'm dealing with this and I can be content or I can be happy with what God has in store for me. I know that that sounds, you know, just like a simple statement. And I understand that it's a lot more difficult because we are an emotional people and when things don't work out right, we get frustrated, we get tired, we get upset. And, uh, and so it becomes a little bit more difficult uh, to operate in that manner um, of happiness. But really, nobody else, your spouses can't make you happy. Your kids can't make you happy. Happiness is a personal point of reference or a personal perspective. And you get to choose whether you're not that you're going to be happy. Now, obviously, all the different situations of life affect that decision and that perspective, but I want to encourage you to look at each situation with a smile on your face, knowing that God's got you in his hand. He knows exactly where you are and what you're dealing with. He knows who's trying to affect you. He knows the situation that's trying to affect you. And as a, as a friend of mine uh, once said a long, long time ago, nothing ever occurred to him. And uh, it doesn't occur to God. God. Nothing occurs to God. God knows it all already. So you might as well trust that he's got you in the palm of his hand. We used to sing the old Sunday school song, he's got the whole world in his hands. Well, I believe that tonight, and I believe that I'm part of that world. So he's got me in his hands, and I can be happy about that no matter what's going on around me. So number one, don't compare yourself to others and judge others. Number two, no one is in charge of your happiness except you. Uh, number three is another one that sounds almost uh, difficult to grasp and almost patronizing, but time does heal almost everything. So give yourself some time. Um, I think some of us get so rushed um, and we're so perfectionist. We try to, you know, we get frustrated with ourselves and we don't get the first thing right the first time. And uh, when we take a step back and realize, man, we've never done this before, then all of a sudden things seem to be a little bit better. But time does heal all things. And, uh, in fact, I remember the day that my father shared with us that he had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer uh, in January of 2011. And uh, it was a punch to the gut, and it was uh, a heavy conversation that we had. And, and my dad, in the way that my dad was, he tried to, 
to calm us down as a family and try to see the goodness in, in the situation and tried to uh, calm everybody's nerves, but it was still a heavy conversation and it was a heavy night. And there's others that are watching this that have experienced those kind of conversations. I know we're not the only ones. Um, but I remember the, 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 it was, it was all of our nerves. That situation was on the edge of all of our nerves, uh, for the next couple of years, even to watch my dad go through that and to ultimately gain his victory into glory in 2012. But now after eight years, do I miss him? Yes. But is it right at the end of my nerves? Not all the time. There are those moments that I have, but now I look back and I, I'm so appreciative for what he stood for, what he put into my life, who he was as a man, who he was as a pastor, who he was as a friend. And uh, now I'm looking at his life and there's not that that necessarily that broken heart for him being gone. It's now, okay, dad, what, what did you teach me in the time that we had together on this earth? Let me take what you taught me. Let me take what you gave me and apply it to my life. And, uh, but in that first moment, uh, it was hard. It was the, the nerves were frayed. The emotions were up and down, um, and, and things of that nature. But time really does, seem to help uh, and heal certain things. So give your situation times. On the flip side of that, um, there's things that we try to rush into and we want to have it happen now. And uh, it's one of the things that uh, people that are called to do something for God specifically uh, oftentimes don't understand that Moses' call to lead the people of Israel out, whether he realized it or not, happened when his mother put him in the in the basket on the Nile River. That's when it started, and it was 80 years until Moses came back to Pharaoh and led the people of Israel out of Egypt. So the time that God asks you to do something, don't get rushed to do it. Give yourself time. Give God time. He has a perfect time for you, and Preparation time with God is not wasted time. Preparation time with God is time that he will equip you. And what we don't often understand is everything that we obtain in life through life is God allowing things to happen to teach us how to uh, react in the situation that he has planned for us. Uh, I preach a message called Chocolate Chip Cookies and uh, the concept of all things work together for good. If you, take a, if you take a chocolate chip cookie, or if you don't like chocolate chip, oatmeal, raisin, sugar, whatever it is, and, uh, but if you take the individual ingredients and you eat them on your own, they don't taste very good. Uh, baking soda doesn't taste very good by itself. Salt doesn't taste very good by itself. Even too much sugar doesn't taste too good by itself. But when you put it in there, take some dry oats. If you're having oatmeal raisin dry, try taking that and eat some of that dry and see how, uh, how fulfilling that taste is. But when you mix it all together and you cook it at the right temperature and the heat comes on at the right amount, by the end of that, you have a delicious cookie. Well, God does the same thing with us. He takes the sweet things of our lives like the chocolate chips and the sugar and he takes the salt and the baking soda and the flour and the eggs and he puts it all together and he puts a certain amount of heat into our life, a certain amount of testing, a certain amount of resistance and because not to, um, uh, to, to uh, damage us but to perfect us and prepare us for when we come out of the oven and begin to activate what God is trying to create in us and when that begins to happen, um, but have you ever had a, a cookie that wasn't quite done? Now, I know there's a big, for me, I like crispier cookies, um, and, and I don't like doughy cookies, um, but just an unfinished cookie, you'd, you'd be crazy to, to get all the ingredients on the counter and say, well, I can't wait to have a chocolate chip cookie, so I'll take a chocolate chip and a teaspoon of baking soda, and we'll just mix it together and eat it, and, and, and now I've had my cookie. Well, no, that's crazy. And but that's what we do with God. God says, okay, I want to do this and I want to do this and I want to do this. And so we've got all the ingredients and we want to have it happen right then. 
but we can't do it right then because it hasn't been mixed, it hasn't been connected, it hasn't been united. So give yourself time. Time is your friend. And I, I understand that there is a lot of terminology out there and expression that we're running out of time and there's and uh, that the time is coming to a close and Jesus is coming soon and we've got to get to do this, we've got to get doing this. At the same time, uh, I have to remind you that if you're walking hand in hand with Jesus, his timing is always perfect. And so we have to understand that when Jesus does return, there will be people on the way to their miracle. There will be people in the middle of their miracle. There will be people that have just come through their miracle. It doesn't mean that God's timing is off or that we have to rush what God is trying to do in us sit back, take a re-examination of it, and, and apply the amount of time needed in order to prepare for what God is trying to do. Uh, I'm thankful that God gives us time. When I first felt the call of the Lord in my life, I was 11 years old. Uh, like I've told the church several times, I can take you to the spot out at Great Cloud Island in Cottage Grove at Camp Galilee as an 11-year-old boy on the platform, uh, sitting in the back row where we played our instruments. And like I've always said, I played my instruments because we always had fans on the platform. And so it was cooler up there. But uh, I remember getting on my face before God and feeling the call of God to become a minister of the gospel, to become a pastor. And so that was 11. And I didn't really become a pastor all the way until I was just about uh, 39 years old. And so that length of time, God was preparing me. I could have uh, rushed it. I could have stepped into situations and taken over churches that I wasn't designed to take over as a leader and could have caused myself headaches and heartaches, could have caused those people headaches and heartaches. But he took me in every level, and every step of my life and prepared me for the time that when the time was right to accept the role that God had called me to so many years ago. So time heals almost everything, so give your situation time. Uh, number four, this is very difficult for some of us to deal with, but what other people think of you is none of your business. What other people think of you is none of your business. Uh, sometimes we get so worried about what people are going to think about us that it paralyzes us from accomplishing what God wants us to accomplish. Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't mean that we need to go out there just trying to offend everybody and just stomping on everybody's toes and, and not using any tact or anything of that nature. I'm, I'm, but what I am saying is don't do things based off of what somebody, what your expectation of what somebody else is thinking about you. What somebody else thinks about you, that's not your business, that's their business. All you can be is who you are and who God called you to be. And if you're really doing what God called you to be and be who God called you to be, then what they, it doesn't matter what they think, okay? And, 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 and there again, I know that sometimes this is difficult because uh, the majority of us don't want to have enemies. We don't want to offend people. I mean, I'm sure there's some of those people out there that just want to offend everybody and get on people's nerves. I'm sure that there's some of them. But for the most part, people just want to have, they're not confrontational. They just want to have uh, a, a peace between their relationships. And <clears throat> too often, though, uh, for instance, let me just give you an example. God is, you're in the middle of a church service and the presence of God is moving and you feel to either go pray for somebody or to speak out or to have tongues and interpretation or to give a word of prophecy or to do something that God is trying to prompt you to do and you hesitate doing it because you're afraid of Sally down the row isn't going to, to appreciate or they're going to think something negative about you or they're going to have questions about who you are and who do you think you are being used by God and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you paralyze and you don't do it. And you and so you, you stay silent. And what ends up happening is your silence then is affecting the church in a negative way because they're not being released to hear the word of the Lord that God has asked you to give. 
uh, and even taking it outside of the church setting, um, there's been times where people have been prompted. We've heard testimonies of our people where God has prompted them to do something and they didn't do it because they were thinking that the person that uh, they were going to give it to uh, or, or to say something to or invite somebody wasn't going to be receptive to it because they were worried about what they were going to think about us. It's not our business. All we can do is what God wants us to do. And when we do it, usually people will respond uh, in a positive light. I've only had, a th if I, if my memory is right, I've only had one person in all the years that I've served God that when I've asked them if I could pray for them, I've only had one person ever say no. Most people will say yes, even if they don't believe in prayer, even if they don't believe in God. And uh, so when God prompts you to do something, don't worry about what other people are thinking. When God moves you into an area of prayer, don't worry about what other people are thinking. When God asks you to step across the, the fence line and approach a neighbor with the good news of the gospel, don't hesitate worrying about what they're going to think of you. They're going, they've, they've already thought it if they haven't already, if, if they're not going to think any different because you've done that because they've already watched you living on the other side of the fence. So you might as well just go ahead and let them know Jesus is real. And uh, so what other people think of you is none of your business. Don't worry about it. Don't fight it. Don't go purposely trying to offend people, but don't worry about what people are going to think about you or reject you or uh, it's none of your business. You just do what God wants you to do. Uh, obedience is what God is looking for. And when we obey God, then he's going to bless us one way or the other. And then the last one that I want to share with you tonight is simply this. Make peace with your past so it doesn't disturb your present. Make peace with your past so it doesn't disturb your present. It doesn't matter what your past is. Um, it can be a negative past or it can be a positive past. Uh, I've been blessed for the most part in my life to have a positive. I had a great childhood. I had great parents. I had a great church. I was blessed beyond measure looking back. Yes, there were a lot of things that I had to deal with, uh, but I had a great support system around me. But you want to know what? Even with a great support system, even with... Um, a great family, great parents, a great church, um, I had to make some decisions. I had to make some choices based off of what was going on in my life. I had to deal with situations of my past and I had to come to the conclusion or I had to come to peace with some wrong decisions, some, uh, you know, just different aspects of life that you're trying to choose and trying to go. And, and all of us have made mistakes all of us have gotten messed up. All of us have been in one way or another um, because we're all humanity. And we're, we all have that old nature in us that fights against the things of God. Uh, I wish I could tell you that I've always wanted to be in church, but there were a lot of times where, especially when I was growing up, I didn't have a choice whether I was going to be in church. That was just the way it was in my household. My dad said, if the church doors are open, we're basically going to be at church. And uh, even when we went on vacation, oftentimes we would go on vacation and we would find a church to go to while we were on vacation. It was just something that was inbred in me from a young age. But there came a time when I was old enough, I was a, to the point where I had to decide for myself, am I going to continue what my father put in me or am I going to go my own direction? Am I going to do my own thing? And so we have to make peace with some of those decisions that we've made. We have also have to make peace with some of the nasty stuff of our past. And when I say make peace with, I don't mean just, I've heard it say, you know, just let go of your past. Well, you, it's impossible to let go of your past without putting your past in the hands of somebody else. And, and so you need to put your past, when I say make peace with your past, you have to take your past to the peacemaker. You have to take your past into the, the, the one that gives peace that passes all understanding. Uh, whatever your past is, whatever sins are there, whatever abuse is there, whatever neglect is there, whatever abandonment is there, whatever addiction is there, whatever your background is, whatever your religious beliefs were, 
you need to come to a place where that is no longer plaguing you in the present. And you can only do that by placing that in the hands of Jesus Christ, by falling before him and, and relinquishing your past to him because uh, his, he's already paid for your past. It was paid, on, paid for on Calvary when he died uh, on the cross. And, and so your past has the ability to be released to him and he can take all of the stuff that you dealt with and attach it to the cross and set you free so that in the present and in the future, but mostly right now in the present, it's, your past isn't being a disturbance or a distraction. There's a lot of people that, that forget that we are a very present people and decisions that we make now in the present are going to dictate what's going to happen in the future. And the problem is, is we cannot allow the decisions of the present to be distorted by the effects of our past. Okay, uh, we don't, we don't, God uses going back to um, the concept of, uh, of God mixing us all up to make us something beautiful. He takes that addiction. He takes that anger. He takes that bitterness. He puts it all together and he creates something beautiful out of it. But, uh, and, and so I'm not saying to forget your past, but I'm saying make peace with it. Turn it over to Christ. Let him handle it. Let him deal with it. And let him be the one that's allowed to uh, control your past so that your present decision-making is not affected because 20 years ago you made a mistake and committed a sin. Okay? There's too many people that uh, are, are wrapped up and paralyzed in their present and that's affecting their future because they're connected to t tightly or too closely to that which has happened to them in previous years. Listen, I know some of us have a terrible past, a terrible story of where we but it can be turned around. Your test can be your testimony. Your mess can be your message. Your, your past can be that thing which now propels you into the goodness and the glory and the grace of God. When things begin to happen in the, the, the spiritual realm around you and you begin to be used by God, you can release yourself into the freedom that God has created in you and your future can be assured because you have made peace with your past. Um, I, I, so there's some people that, uh, that I've watched through the years that things that have taken place, whether it be things that they've done or had done to them or just circumstances that they were involved in have hindered them from making the right decision now. Uh, and one of the, one of the statements or the, the questions is, is, well, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to have this happen to me right now. I've got too, too dark of a past or I've messed up too many times. Listen, God doesn't operate in the past. God operates in the now. The Bible says it this way. He is an ever-present help in the time of trouble. He doesn't just operate. He settles the past. He operates in the presence. He's preparing the future. And so I encourage you tonight to find your uh, place or your way to put keeping your past in the hands of the master and let him deal with that and you operate in your present so that you can make the best informed decisions uh, of your present moment so that your future can be assured. It's not God's will that we should be paralyzed from moving in his spirit because of a lack of worthiness or uh, because we're not good enough or we don't have the ability to do it or uh, or we feel the condemnation of our past hammering down on us. The Bible says in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation. And so my question to you tonight is this. Do you trust God's ability to choose the right people? I know that sounds like almost a crazy question, but most of us would answer that very quickly. Oh yeah, I trust him to make the right decision to choose the right people. But at the same time we say that when he chooses us, there's always a hes hesitancy. There's always because of our past. We always say, oh, you're not really asking me God. 
you're, you're really talking about him. Well, if he was talking about him, he would have talked about him. He's talking about us. He's talking about you. He's saying, I want you to do something or be something or say something or live something. I'm trusting you. I'm asking you to do it. And his choices are the right choices. He always chooses the right one. He always chooses the right person for the, the, the plan or the job that he has for them at that moment. There was a reason why Simon Peter was chosen when he was chosen, because Simon Peter was just bold and brazen enough to stand up on the day of Pentecost and declare the word of the Lord. There's a reason why he chose Saul of Tarsus when uh, he had a conversion and became Paul. He, he saw the zealous nature of Paul uh, towards God, and, and he thought he was doing God's work by coming against this new Christian movement. In, in all actuality, he had to have a conversion experience, and when he did, then he faced shipwreck, and he faced uh, prison, and he faced uh, chances of being de uh, being murdered and, and killed and, and all of those things. And he had to go in, before all different kinds of people. And because he was bold enough to realize that he was in love with Jesus because of the call of Jesus, he trusted Paul. And today he's trusting you. Today he's saying, listen, it doesn't matter what you've done in the past. I'm asking you right now to be what I want you to be and to do what I want you to do. I'm trusting you to do it. That's God speaking that into his people this at this hour in this season. Um, I have often said it this way. God did not choose uh, Simon, Peter, and Paul, and John, and Luke for 2020. He chose us. He chose, and I won't even start to name names because I'll forget people, but everybody that's listening to me, everybody that's a part of Spirit of Grace Church, a part of the kingdom of God around the world, he chose us for 2020. He put us in this era and this he, he he knows enough about us to stay strong, to be faithful, to allow our present to be alive and to be anointed and, and to be uh, in, in our present is not colored by our past so that when we make our decisions today, our future is assured. We are a, a, a people of power. We are a people of authority, not based on who we are and what we've done, but because he has chosen us. Uh, in First Peter uh, uh, two nine, I believe it, it is. Let me look it over. God makes some statements through His uh, 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 apostle here, and uh, and I want to remind you of it as I'm coming to a close. He said this: "You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people." that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And we like that scripture. We are a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are a peculiar people. Peculiar just means a, a called out group. He's, he's put a line around us uh, in order for us to be his people. But we often stop at verse number nine, but the punctuation on verse number nine doesn't end. It goes into verse 10, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. Listen, my friend, we are the people of God, the children of God. We are, this is how God sees you. So if you're looking at yourself through the lens of your past and your past isn't, isn't as good as you think it should be, you need to take those glasses off and put on the glasses of the Spirit and begin to look at yourself the way Jesus looks at you through these words. You are chosen. This generation of believers is a chosen generation. We are royalty. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation, a peculiar people, and we have a responsibility to show forth the praises of him who've called us out of darkness. Our present determination has to be, I need to show others what he's brought me out of to where I am today. And because where I am today is going to dictate where I'm going to go tomorrow, I know in myself that my past has been covered by the blood and God sees me in a new light and in a new way. Which had not obtained mercy, again in verse 10, but have now obtained mercy. You and I were a merciless people, but now he's given us mercy. We didn't have mercy before. 
your past, the reason why your past needs to be the past and you need to come uh, to peace with it is because you didn't have mercy when you were in the past, but now you have mercy. You have come into contact with the mercy giver. You have come into contact with the God of mercy. His mercies are new every morning, and I'm thankful for them. And that is why I can get excited about the life that he wants me to live and that more abundantly, that more superior, that more clearly, that more more uh, uh, further than my norm because God, that's why he came. That's what he's wanting to do. He's wanting to give you a life that goes beyond your imagination in him. And remember what life is. Life is an active and vigorous devotion to God and blessing in the in John 10:10 10, 10, which we read tonight. I came that they might have life, that they might have an active and vigorous devotion to God, and that they might have it more abundantly. My prayer for you tonight all across this Facebook plane uh is that you would find that vigorous life of God, devotion to God, and that you would have it in supreme measure that it would be overflowing in you. And if you'll take these five things to heart over the next couple of days and bring them to the Lord, don't compare yourself to others and don't judge them. You don't know what journey they've been on. No one is in charge of your happiness except you. Time heals almost everything, so give yourself some time. What other people think of you is none of your business. And make peace with your past so it doesn't disturb your present and affect your future. Would you join me in prayer tonight? Jesus, I'm so thankful that we've been able to look into your word. I'm thankful, God, that you saw fit to bring us life and more abundantly. I'm thankful, God, that we can lean on you, and lean not on our own understanding, but acknowledge you, lean on you, embrace you, and allow you to lead and guide us. Lord, there's somebody that has been listening here tonight or will be listening here uh, as we air this online, I'm asking you, God, to meet them where they're at and allow them to sense the presence of God usher into wherever they're listening or watching this and let them sense the glory of God wrap itself around them and the anointing of God bless them. And we'll be careful to give you praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' wonderful name, we pray. I thank you for joining us tonight on Facebook and all of the watch parties that are connected to our Facebook feed. We're so thankful for the technological ability to, to come into your homes, and we're honored beyond measure that you would take the time to listen and to send your encouraging posts are wonderful. We just love you all so much, and we're so thankful to be a part of the kingdom of God. God bless you. We'll have our services again broadcast sometime Sunday afternoon, and then we'll be back live next Wednesday night should the Lord tarry. Blessings to all.